Good morning, church. It's not a, probably a good idea for a preacher to do this, but you do it on your own anyway. I'm going to invite you to daydream for just a little bit. To let your mind wander off a bit, but let me give you some direction. I want to invite you to picture yourself living a particular kind of life. A kind of life where you have real joy in the midst of sometimes the most painful and confusing and difficult situations, something that abides within even during those times, even when you're personally attacked or rejected just for trying to do the right thing. Picture joy in the midst of that. Or picture a life in which you very naturally use your influence at every opportunity for good, for, for God, for the kingdom, in the highest sense possible in every situation and circumstance of life, your influence flows into that. Imagine a life where you learn to live with such an authentic sense of righteousness in your life that you don't need any laws or rules to guide you. God's ways have just become a part of the DNA of the way you live life. Imagine that you learn to deal with other people's failures and sins and mistakes with grace and with forgiveness and compassion rather than with hate and retaliation. You've Learn to let God so rule the deepest and darkest desires of your life in such a way that other people are never treated as objects of lust for your thoughts or pleasures, but always as persons who bear the image of God. Imagine relating to every single person all the time that way. A life in which you willingly let go of anything that would ever lead you in a different direction. Imagine a love life where you're learning to experience a deeper and deeper growing love and faithfulness to your spouse if you're married. That's in line with God's desire for your marriage. Visualize a life where your words and your deeds so perfectly match each other that you never have to take an oath to get people to believe you. Your promises are just things you seek to carry out. You don't parse words and you don't play with promises, you just keep them. Even those who would act against you are people that you would genuinely love. Imagine that. Visualize a, a life where your acts of piety, your giving and your worship and your prayer, are done with an audience of just one. All that matters is that God knows you and knows your heart and sees that. You're not seeking to shape public opinion by how religious or pious you are. You're learning to approach God like a child coming to her father. You learn to live life that way. Imagine that. Imagine that the things that you now truly value are things that are deeply eternal. You've given up a long time ago trying to satisfy your life with building a reputation or building a bank account. God is now getting your full, wholehearted devotion and trust. Your heart is no longer divided between God and things. Imagine a life where... Your anxiety over the future is just a thing of the past. You've learned to trust God as your sanctuary, your refuge, your rock. God is present to provide the things that you need through life. Anxiety about the future is not there. Contentment with life on a daily basis here and now is rising. You're learning more and more to live in the present and reje rejecting the cultural message of dissatisfaction that we're bombarded with in so many ways. You're learning to let go of covetousness, greed, worry, hurry, and noise are less and less a part of your life on a daily basis. Imagine that. Other people receive from you what you would like to receive from them, compassion and grace and encouragement and love. You've made a decision to deliberately head down the narrow road of following after Jesus. And that's what life is focused on. The fruit of your life is showing up on the branches of your life like real fruit, not like Christmas tree decorations hung up to, as ornaments, but out of the very heart of who you are, the fruit of the life of following Christ is showing up on a regular basis. You no longer just refer to Jesus as Lord, but you seek to bring your life under his authority day in and day out in every kind of situation. You don't find yourself in any way exempted from the trials and difficulties of this life. They're still there, but you know what it is to face the unfairness and the confusion and the storms of situations and circumstances, the unexplainable, the painful, to face all of that, and when the storm is past, to still be standing. Those storms don't blow your life away. Picture such a life. 
because that is the kind of life Jesus Christ intends for us. It's the life he described in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 as the Sermon on the Mount. He said, this is what life abundant looks like. It looks like a life in which you are authentic and love God with all of your heart and love your neighbor as yourself, and it shows up in these kinds of ways. Here, he said, is what life of a disciple of mine looks like when it's done. Imagine that. Dallas Willard called such a life, this life described in the Sermon on the Mount, as life on the rock. He takes that from the last few verses of the Sermon on the Mount. You're probably well familiar with them, but I'd like you to hear them again from Eugene Peterson's paraphrase of them in his work, The Message. This is Matthew 7, 24 through 29. Jesus speaking, These words I speak to you are not incidental additions to your life, homeowner improvements to your standard of living. They are foundational words, words to build a life on. If you work these words into your life, you'll be like a smart carpenter who built his house on a rock. Rain poured down, the river flooded, a tornado hit, but nothing moved that house. It was fixed to the rock. But if you just use my words in Bible studies and don't work them into your life, you're like a stupid carpenter who built his house on a sandy beach. When a storm rolled in and the waves came up, it collapsed like a house of cards. Jesus said these things he taught us in the Sermon on the Mount and elsewhere are not just good things to know. They're not nifty little ideas to pull out occasionally or to decoupage and hang on a wall. They're not something to post on Facebook or Twitter. They're, they're stuff that's supposed to be worked into the very fabric of how you and I actually live our lives. He really intended us to find life by obeying it. They're meant to be not just believed, but lived and done. To put it as bluntly as possible, the life of discipleship is the life of intentional, decisive following after Jesus. Intentionally decisively following after Jesus. There's no promise in Jesus' words that life on the rock is a life that is immune from storms. Maybe you remember this photograph from Ike a few years ago down on Bolivar Peninsula. One house built to a different code than the others. And this is what it looked like when the storm had passed. Jesus is calling us to a life that is built on an entirely different code than that of life lived without him. And he doesn't promise us exemption from storms, but he does promise us the capacity to withstand the storms. That's his promise. Life on the rock is not a life of religion. It's more a life of spirituality. It is a life of learning to live with God and with people in rich relationship. The God who has revealed himself to us in Jesus Christ. It's a life of learning to live all that we believe about God. Actually live it. Life on the rock is about a life of apprenticeship to Jesus. An apprentice is a person who puts himself into a particular relation under a particular set of conditions to, a, to another. Here's somebody who knows how to do something I want to know how to do. And if I apprentice with them, I spend time with them under a particular set of conditions so that over time I can learn to do what I can't do now, but that that person can do. That's what apprenticeship is about. And to apprentice with Jesus is to say, here is the Son of God who knows what human life is meant to be lived like. And if I will put myself in relationship with him under those conditions and learn to do what he does and allow him to be my teacher and it, the one who empowers me, I can learn to live the life that he demonstrated to us and that he called us to. It is about apprenticeship. The life I described a few minutes ago, or rather the life Jesus described in the Sermon on the Mount, is the life that God intends human beings to know. It's a slice of it. And it's not merely theoretical. Jesus lived that life. And he said to us, follow me. I'm still a little bit amazed, having grown up in Baptist life, you know, prenatally. I mean, I was in church before I was breathing air on the planet. 
I've been in Baptist life for a long time. I was born in a Baptist hospital. Okay, it just, it's deep in me, okay? <laughs> but how much emphasis we have placed over time about coming to faith and salvation and how little emphasis we've placed over time on learning to live the life Jesus taught us to live. We've tried to tell our young people and our young adults and our older adults to be good and be nice, but this is more about than about being good and being nice. This is about learning to live the life God created human beings to live, and he demonstrated for us in Jesus Christ. Jesus, as far as I can tell, never told a single person to ask him into their heart. He said, follow me. Become my apprentice. Come learn to live this life. He that hears my words and does them will be like the person who builds life on a rock. He who hears my words and doesn't do them will be like the foolish person who built on the sand. It is about learning to live the very life he's called us to live. You stop and think about it. Why would somebody not want to apprentice with Jesus? Well, I think sometimes we just have a different mental model about what Christianity is. It's, we've sometimes just reduced it to content. If I learn these facts and learn these things and these doctrines and these practices and participate in these programs, or sometimes we reduce Christianity to what some have called sin management. We're just trying to keep between the lines and do the best we can not to sin too much. That's a negative view of what this life is called to. Sometimes we have a mental model that Christianity is simply getting to heaven when we die. It's more than that. It certainly includes spending eternity with God in heaven, but it begins with a following of Jesus in this life now. I think sometimes we uh, don't pay attention to this because we don't really believe Jesus knows what he's talking about. Jesus is the Savior. He died on the cross. We never thought that he might actually be the most brilliant person who's ever walked on the earth that he might actually know what he's talking about. We're willing to be taught by almost anybody. They've got enough degrees behind them or enough success in their past. But how little do we, who are followers of Jesus, just go and say, show me the red letters. Let me hear his words. What does Jesus have to teach me about how this life is to be lived? And let me learn from him like I would learn from the most brilliant teacher in my field. Sometimes I think we just don't really believe he knows what he's talking about. It's, sometimes I think we don't know where to start. We're just overwhelmed. You read life on the Sermon on the Mount and you go, how would you ever begin living a life? How do you learn to love your enemies? How do you learn to turn the other cheek? How do you learn to do unto others what you would have them do to you? How do you learn to give your life in prayer and worship in a way that the audience is only God and not trying to impress? How, how do you how do you do that? We're overwhelmed, I think, at times. Sometimes we've tried to create a life, something like that, and we fail. We just work really hard at it and try to be like Jesus, and it didn't seem to work so well in our own power. C.S. Lewis wrote, Our faith is not a matter of our hearing what Christ said long ago and trying to carry it out. Rather, he said, the real Son of God alive, is at your side. He's beginning to turn you into the same kind of thing as himself, fully human. He is beginning, so to speak, to inject his kind of life and thought, his life, into you, beginning to turn the tin soldier into a live man. That part of you that does not like it is the part that is still tin. He really wants our lives to be aligned with this, that he calls us to follow him. And I think sometimes we put it aside because the whole thing seems idealistic. Really? You'd really expect to live like this? That's how Jesus lived, and he invited us to follow him, and he promised to give us life abundant, and it looks like that. What Jesus called us to do is to be his disciples, to apprentice with him for the living of life, in the kingdom of the heavens, and to make disciples. That's what he's called us to do. He's calling us to live life on the rock, the life of decisive, intentional discipleship.
So because it's intentional, we need to have a plan. We need to have some sense of what we're going to do. It's not something that accidentally happens. Nobody accidentally becomes that kind of a person. Nobody accidentally follows Jesus. We firmly decide that we are going to follow him, listen to him, that he is going to be our teacher and our Lord. And then we make plans and take necessary steps to do whatever is necessary to learn this thing we want to learn. Dallas Willard said that such a life is entered into in what he said three steps. He uses a little acronym V-I-M, VIM. Vision, intention, and means. See, that's how we learn anything. We decide we want to learn to speak Arabic? Well, we're not going to do that just because we thought it was a good idea one day. We need a vision of what it would mean to be able to speak Arabic in a world like ours and who we could communicate with and who we could listen to. And so we get a vision of what that's like, and then intention, we decide to do it. We make a decision, this is going to be what I'm going to learn, and then we choose means. It might be getting a Rosetta Stone course, or it might be enlisting in a course. It might be finding a friend who speaks Arabic to sit and converse with. It might be starting to read Arabic newspapers or whatever. We find the means necessary to do what it is we want to learn. And he says the same way with following Jesus. It begins with a vision. We begin to think about what it would look like to truly be his disciple. And we decide that that's what we want more than anything else in the world is to learn over time to live such a life with him. Desire is the beginning. We fall in love with Jesus and we want desperately to have life as he lived it, as he taught it, and as he offers it to us. That's the vision. And then there is intention and mean. So how do we do this? Well, one thing we do early on is having a vision for it, we ask for it. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 7, ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock, the door will be open to you. Whoever asks, receives. Whoever seeks, finds. Whoever knocks, the door is open. And there is this invitation there for us simply to ask the Father, not to make our life easier, but to make our life deeper, to make our life more substantial, to make it more like Christ. We begin to pray for that. Most of our prayers are Around those subjects are much more about confession of where we failed. And we need to ask, just ask. And then there needs to be some clear vision of this. Where do you get that? I think you do it by spending a lot of time with the Gospels personally. We read these stories until they become more and more familiar to us. And the image and picture of Jesus, not only what he said, but what he did, becomes clearer and clearer. And the vision gets to be clearer. And then part of the vision is developed by finding people who have that same desire. Some of those people are dead. They're like C.S. Lewis and they're like St. Augustine. They're a long list of people who over the centuries have had a vision for following after Jesus Christ. Some of those people are alive and they're our teachers. Some of them are our friends. But we spend our time and our conversations more and more with people who want what we want. That's one of the ways the vision is developed. Find others with the same desire. And then intention comes to play. We decide to pursue the life under Jesus' teaching and authority. Now, we use the word intend in our language kind of loosely. Most of the time, it's an excuse. Why didn't you do that? Well, I intended to. No, you didn't. If you had intended to, you would have done it. To intend something is to put your mind to it and say, this is what I'm going to do. And we become intentional about how we follow Jesus Christ. We begin to use those things that... Help. There's deliberate action. This life we want is available to us, but it's not accidental and it doesn't fall on us. It is very much following Jesus intentionally, deliberately, decisively ordering our lives around his teaching and his presence. You apprentice yourself to Christ. Choose a solemn moment and go to him and just reiterate, I want to follow you. <clears throat> um, within a short walking distance of my um, house, our apartment on Baylor campus, is the Student Life Center, which has a, a you know, very modern, up-to-date gym inside of it. It's within walking distance of my house. I used to have a student at our church who would come up and go, you been working out? And uh, no, I didn't think so. Uh, so... Those machines in that gym, uh, they, they don't just give off health. You can't go, you know, pick up a 
fruit drink and walk around the gym and watch people working out and, and suddenly be stronger and uh, healthier and better off. You actually have to get on the machines, it turns out. A and otherwise, they don't have any effect in our life. Hanging out with people who also profess faith in Christ doesn't necessarily take us very far along. There are practices that we're called to get involved with. Um, there is prayer. There is worship. There is reading and meditating on Scripture. There is finding times of silence and solitude. These spiritual practices that God uses to shape us. Not things we do to, give God, to get God's attention and say, look at how good I am. But things we do to give God our attention so that God can shape us. And so Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount calls us to pray and fast and give and do the things that shape us. But you actually have to get on them. I respect former Marines a lot. One of my best friends at Truett Seminary, one of our faculty, is Terry York, who's a former Marine. And I've often said that I would like to be a former Marine. <laughs> I really wouldn't want to go through all that it takes to be a former Marine, but I would just like to be a former Marine. And sometimes it's the way with discipleship. We really would like all that stuff, but actually this calls us to intentional practice and to give ourselves to it. I wrote a little parable. Let me read this to you and we got done. Bob wanted to be a lawyer. He read John Grisham novels and watched reruns of Perry Mason, Paper Chase, Matlock. Weekly, he took in old episodes of Allie McBeal, Law and Order, and The Good Wife. He seemed to kill a mockingbird dozens of times. Bob wanted to go to college, major in pre-law, and get admitted to the best law school in the state. He dreamed of finishing law school, following a career as a DA, maybe even as a judge, perhaps even a federal judge, or a state Supreme Court position. He could just picture what it was like to deal with issues of truth and justice, law and order. But getting started proved a problem for Bob. He thought the forms required for entrance were just a little too much to complete. And the schedule of classes was going to interfere with his job at a fast food restaurant. So he decided to put it off till he felt more ready. But his interest in the law never waned. He still read Grisham's latest novel, watched his Matlock reruns faithfully, recording every episode. After a couple of years, he met the girl of his dreams. They married, and he found a more substantial job actually working in a courthouse. He loved being around the lawyers and the judges. The job didn't pay much, but it was a great place to be. Bob stayed with it and actually got a chance to move up to a more responsible role working in one of the courts, close to the action. He thought about the day he'd have his own law office or even his own court. Meanwhile, his Grisham novels and Matlock reruns kept the dream alive. Bob and his wife had two children. Bob worked hard to support his family, but he never did get around to filling out those application forms for college. But he practically memorized the Grisham books and could recite episodes of Matlock from memory. Sometimes this is what discipleship is like. It's just out there. But we have to take those steps that say, I want this one life that I have to live more and more to be conformed to the life that Jesus Christ offered. I want life on the rock. I want to hear his words and do them. Not just hear his words and ignore them. So we have to ask ourselves, probably daily, do I really intend to follow Jesus Christ? If we do, a plan would be in order. And he invites us to life on the rock. Here's an action item we might consider if you'd like to take a more intentional step about this. I would encourage you to take some time today or this week where you sit down and maybe write it in the form of a letter. Lay open your heart for discipleship. What's your hope for following after Jesus? What are the biggest challenges in doing that right now? What's your vision as a disciple? Put it down in a couple of paragraphs. And then I'm going to ask would ask you to, or invite you at least to do something that pastors don't often invite you to do. Send me an email or send it to one of your pastors. Send it to your Sunday school teacher. Just let them know this is my heart for following after Christ and I want to commit to it. And if you don't feel comfortable sending it to someone, just keep it. I think the act of thinking it through, of thinking through intentionally, what do I long for in following after Christ is a very valuable way to move forward. Life on the rock is the life of intentional, decisive discipleship.